Yes, well, thank you very much to Luke and as well to Dan for uh, those fine introductions. Uh, yes, I'm thankful to everyone who came tonight, uh, a special thanks to those who've served in various uh, ways. Tonight, I'm hoping that uh, I'll talk under four headings. I'll do so in my special uh, Renella accent, um, where I grew up down Morford Bay away, where you might see the difference with that and the Flagstaff Hill uh, accent. Uh, but, um, yeah, first, uh, first, who the book is for, I want to say something about that. Second, the problem it's addressing. Third, how confident are the conclusions? And uh, fourth, a summary of the argument. Uh, so, first, uh, who, the book, who the book is for? Uh, there was a, a 2017 survey, I guess it's getting a little dated, but uh, by McCrindle that found that 34% of Australians... Uh, were blocked from engaging with Christianity by its stance on science and evolution. Uh, I don't know if you can read that. It says about five lines down, 23% were blocked completely and 11% significantly. So this book uh, is for that 34% uh, or for you, if that's you. Uh, it's aiming to open the door at least a little to this third of the Australian population so that they might feel more able to consider the Bible's claims, to consider uh, Jesus. It's also a book for the many Christians who get to the point where they are troubled by questions of origins, because there are many who have a, a crisis of faith around whether the Bible's just wrong on origin stories, whether it's factually incorrect. So the book is for people like them, hoping to catch them before they abandon Jesus. Again, the book's for those, Christian or not, who see that the issues around evolution pose important questions about human identity, and we've heard a bit about that already, haven't we? That is, if we are sourced biologically from humans, as evolution affirms, if we are sourced biologically from animals, well, I presume it still is clear that it presses on all of us that killing any animal is different from killing any human that stealing from any, any animal is different from stealing from any human, that sexual relations can never be rightly expressed with an animal, but only ever with a human, your human spouse, as the Bible teaches. I presume it presses on all of us that every human has dignity and value above any animal. Uh, if all that is true then, and we, it's not just that we feel it, but also it's objectively true, well, how did that state of affairs come about? If you're interested in that question, uh, the book is for you. I do want to tell you who the book's not for. Uh, it isn't for those who already know what they think on the Bible and evolution and are keen, keen to defend their view against all comers, which is to say, I'm, I'm not looking for a fight because there is a lot of heat on this subject in some areas, especially in America, where you can be called uh, a wolf for saying the world might be billions of years old, which I think it is. Uh, so I'm very happy for the wolf callers to stay with their own convictions. Uh, it is a book for those who like short books. It's 140 pages, which is not to say that it's an easy read. Some of the concepts are challenging, but I don't think it's a hard read either. Uh, it's a book for those seeking more detail on the Bible than on the science. Uh, the new ideas in the book are nearly all to do with the Bible, and that's fitting, I think, because I'm a, a pastor, not a professional scientist. Having said that, the book's ideas do lead to a bunch of testable hypotheses that I'm hoping one day some scientists might look at. It's a book for those wanting holistic answers. I mean, there are plenty of places where you can read about the Bible and evolution and opinions given set out as isolated thoughts, not tying the details together. The book is not like that. It's trying to integrate all the things that are said in Genesis 1 to 11 in particular with the history of the world through a timeline. And so it lays out all the key events on a timeline and defends the conclusions as biblically sound and scientifically mainstream. And so you do get a date for the world's formation, for Adam and Eve, for the flood, for the Tower of Babel and more. Secondly, uh, what is the question? Now, what is the question the book is addressing? Well, the opening chapter gives my best attempt to show potential problems with Genesis 1 to 11 
from a scientific point of view. And right now, I want to spend a bit of time, at least, explaining those potential problems, because I'm here to help the doubters and the sceptics. And if that's you, I'm very glad you're here. Uh, I want you to know that I'm not dodging the question. I'm hoping you'll hear this section and you'll say to yourself, well, if you can answer all that, then I'm a little more open to what the Bible's saying. So, here goes. Uh, up until around the time of Charles Darwin, there was a close to unanimous view amongst those who looked at the Bible that you could use the early chapters of Genesis, especially chapters 5, chapters 5 and 11, to make a timeline all the way back to Adam, the first man. So people had disagreements about what that date for Adam should be exactly, but it was agreed that the Bible gave data for the calculation. Uh, the most famous date that you might have heard about was Archbishop James Usher's date of 4004 BC because it was printed in the marginal notes of some versions of the King James Bible. Now, it is easy to see why people thought you could make a timeline from Genesis. Here's a bit of Genesis 5. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. And after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years. And then he died. And so it's fairly clear, isn't it, that uh, from verse 3, there are 130 years between Adam and Seth because Adam was 130 when Seth was born. I think it's fairly straightforward. Forget for a moment whether you think it's possible to live that long. See that this is the straightforward reading. And of course, you can continue into verse 6 and beyond. Don't worry, we're not going to go through the whole lot. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh and so on. And again, it's pretty clear that there are 105 years between Seth and Enosh. So you can take that 105 and add it to 130 and get 235 years between Adam and Enosh, and so on it goes as the family list goes on. And so you make, you make a timeline, you know, you can throw it all on a spreadsheet and you can add up the numbers and you end up in a certain place, right? It's possible that I did that, yeah. <laughs> and it's possible I enjoyed it, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> not everyone is like me. Uh, but then what you can do is you get eventually, as you work your way down, to a, a person or an event that we know the date of in terms of our calendar that we use today in terms of BCs and ADs. And so then you can work backwards and give yourself the date for Adam and for the flood and for the Tower of Babel and so on. And so the dates turn out to be something like this, somewhere between 5500 and 3700 BC for Adam's birth, somewhere between 2900 and 2100 BC for the flood, about 2700 to 2000 BC, somewhere in there for the Tower of Babel story. There's a, a bunch of variation there for factors we won't discuss tonight. They're in the book's appendix for the really keen. But in short, that's what everyone thought for millennia, that you can make a timeline from the biblical data. Come the 19th century and the increasing fossil evidence and new dating techniques and Darwin's theories, our scientists became confident that the date for the earliest humans and the earliest human languages were much earlier than this. So these biblical dates became no longer credible to the mainstream. Uh, that was one of the reasons why, at the end of the 19th century, there's this bloke here called uh, William Henry Green. Uh, he's a lecturer in ancient Hebrew at uh, Princeton, one of Luke's buddies, right? Uh, he said, well, there are gaps... In, not that Luke's that old, you understand. Uh, he said, well, there are gaps in some of the other genealogies, other family lists, in both the Old and New Testaments. That is, sometimes these family lists, they skip a generation or more than one generation. You know, sometimes they call Mike the son of Fred, when really, Mike's the son of Bob and the grandson of Fred. And Bob's here tonight, yeah, thanks. So, uh, so given this is, I don't think I've ever called him Bob before, there you go. Uh, so, not, not in his presence. So, uh, anyway, given this is so, our, fr our friend uh, Mr Green here, argue that there might be uh, gaps in these key genealogies from which we make the timeline. And so, in that case, we shouldn't use the genealogies to make the timeline, because those gaps will make it false. That's what he argued. And many were convinced, and it became then uh, less mainstream amongst 
Bible-believing Christians to try to produce a date for Adam or for the flood or for the Tower of Babel. And people to this day still widely use uh, William Green's argument in the literature you might read. Turns out, though, it's a poor argument. For one thing, even if there were people missing between, say, Seth and Enosh, well, we were still told, weren't we, that Seth was 105 when Enosh was born. So it doesn't change the timeline if there are men between Seth and Enosh. The gap is still 105 years between them, whether or not there was another guy, call him Bruce, in the middle. Because we're told the age gap, we're told Seth was 105 when Enosh was born. Uh, also, the Bible is at great pains through uh, Genesis and beyond to keep giving the age of key players at the birth of their son. That is, it keeps making the effort to give exactly the data needed to produce a timeline uh, as it follows the story of the people who are the centre of the story. Which makes you think the Bible expects us to add those dates together, those ages together, as people did for so long. It's exactly what you need to make the timeline. Why go to such effort if the Bible's not expecting us to do that? And more than that, the only reason we started ducking that conclusion was because of what the scientists were saying in the 19th century, not from anything in the Bible itself. It's a little embarrassing, I guess, that publishers at the time of William Green suppressed arguments against his conclusions. And so Green's suggestions had been repeated for longer than they should have uh, without much critique. All of that means it's best to conclude the Bible is saying Adam was created somewhere around 5000 BC, the flood was about 2900 BC and the Tower of Babel maybe 2000 BC. And that gives us a bunch of problems. Let me list five of the bigger ones, though we've been hearing about them already. Uh, first, you have the issue of the, the mainstream dating techniques place Homo sapiens well before 5000 BC. We can ask, how can the first man, Adam, be in modern-day Iraq in 5000 BC when indigenous peoples were in Australia more like 50,000 BC? Or second, if the Great Flood is taken to have destroyed all humans except Noah's family in around 2900 BC, it is hard to account for the continuous line of written material in Egypt dating as far back as the administrative tags in King Scorpion's tomb well before that time. Or third, irrespective of the timing of the flood, there's not just the question about where the water came from and went, to cover Everest or Mount Ararat, known to the writer. There's also the question of the distribution of animals across the planet, and Luke alluded to this. If all the animals came from an ark in Turkey and fanned out from there, it definitely doesn't look like that. Uh, Richard Dawkins is quite helpful here. He asks, why all the marsupials but no placentals at all came to Australia from the Ark, yet left no trace in places like China or India or the Silk Road? Or why all the armadillos and sloths went only to South America? Or how all 37 species of lemur came to reside only in Madagascar? How could that have happened if they all come, came off the Ark in Turkey in 2900 BC, well after the last, last ice age, where the ice might have helped them make the long journeys. Uh, fourth, there are questions about the development of language. If we take Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel story, to say that the first human language was confused around 2000 BC, how do we have records, multiple written languages, well before that time? Or fifth, if Adam's dated no earlier than 5500 BC, how do we explain things like all the fine cave art that mainstream science dates to well before that time? Are we really going to say these significant works were the creation of some uh, pre-human species? There it is. Hopefully that's enough that you might say, well, yeah, Mike, if you can cover off all those questions from within a high view of the Bible and mainstream view of science, we, you'll have achieved something. That's the aim. But before we try to summarise at least a little bit of the argument, Something briefly, how confident are the conclusions? Because I want to stress that the questions, these questions about evolution in the Bible, they are in the end of secondary importance for Christians. They're not as important as the death and resurrection of Jesus or the Trinitarian nature of God, which is why 
uh, just at the end of the evening. Dan's going to advertise our new, excuse me, Taste and See course here at St George's. Uh, and there you can come and consider the most important claims about Christianity over four meals. Right? And we won't talk about origins and evolution there because it's not central enough to Christianity. The point is, the tone in the book tries to reflect that. I'm not arguing, or the book doesn't argue, that my proposals that I'm about to try and to outline a little, that they're true and others are wrong, but that mine are plausible and at least as plausible as the main alternatives. You'll find a lot said about what's likely or unlikely, what's a weakness and what a strength, so that the language reflects that my goal is to open room for people to say, you know, the Bible still could be true, even the 34% of people finding it really difficult. I'm not saying, in short, it's my way or the highway. So, with all of that, uh, a brief outline of the argument. Uh, I can't cover everything, but let me start with this. I think it makes sense to say that the Garden of Eden, as described in the Bible, needed to be in a different physical world to ours, separated in some fundamental physical way. It's described as a perfect world where you could live forever in paradise, in bliss. And so it seems clear that there couldn't be any things like lightning strikes or earthquakes or annoying mosquitoes or uh, damaging viruses. And it's very hard to see how those things wouldn't bleed over from our world into Eden if Eden were part of our physical world. And lots of people say something like that. It must have been carved off in some fundamental physical way. But I think if we accept that, it pushes us to say more still. So a key thing I propose in the book is that this biblical story implies that after the fall, Adam and Eve continued to live in a world that was physically separated, carved off from our own somehow. Because after all, we're told that it was only some cherubim and a flaming sword stopping them going back to the tree of life. That's there in Genesis 3.24. And so maybe they could even still see into Eden if they could see past the flashing sword, right? And see the tree of life. Which means they've not been moved, as the story tells it, to an entirely different physical setting. It seems likely then that they were still cut off from our physical world. That is, I'm proposing that the world after the fall that Adam and Eve then lived in remained very different from ours. It was so different and better than ours that it helped them and their descendants consistently live to 900 or so years of age and they did that until that world was destroyed by the flood. I'm also proposing that when Cain was punished for killing Abel, that he was banished by God somewhere, somewhere very different. In the world of Cain's banishment, suddenly Cain was afraid he was afraid of being killed. So that his words were, whoever finds me will kill me. Right at the end there, Genesis 4, 14. And that's quite remarkable. Because if he had been banished to a place with no other people, or maybe a couple of siblings who were still growing up, well, surely, don't you think he'd be more worried about being lonely rather than being killed? Earlier, when Adam had been by himself, we were told it was not good for Adam to be alone. And so, if there were hardly any people or none, well, you'd expect Cain to look around his place of banishment and complain to God, I'm going to be so lonely. Well, that's not at all what he says. Instead, he was worried about being killed. Whoever finds me will kill me. It's a wording that makes you think he's seeing many threatening strangers in his new place. Because when he says, whoever finds me, the finding makes you think that they don't know Cain and he doesn't know them since they have to find him before they kill him. And so that seems to be more than enough grounds to propose that Cain's punishment for killing his brother was that he was cast out of the world with Eden and Adam and Eve and that family and the long lifespans. It's grounds to propose that he was cast into our world where there are lots of scary people who died much younger. And so... I propose that Cain found a wife to marry and people to form a city in our world. Genesis 4 gives the details about the wife and the city, if you want to read that. 
what I mean is sometime around 5000 BC, probably before Seth was born in that other world, Cain suddenly appeared, full of fear, in our world, in the place we now call Iraq. And he and his descendants made a big impact on our world, described in Genesis 4. And the world he left behind, the world he was banished from, went on for another 2,000 years or so, with most of the people living those very long lifespans, that's what's being described, until that world was destroyed in a great flood. And, here's what I'm proposing, in around 2900 BC, on a mountain out in Turkey somewhere, called Ararat, a huge boat suddenly appeared, and Noah's family and a bunch of animals disembarked without our world ever having been totally flooded. And much of my book explains how this makes sense of a lot of Genesis. Like why to Noah, the animals were only afraid of humans after the flood, but not before. Or how some of the descendants of Noah looked to age surprisingly better than those around them, which has to do with people coming out of a world that had been designed for eternal life, and that the effects took a few generations to wear off, even in our world. And so you read stories of Sarah being taken into Pharaoh's harem, age 65 or older. Still incredibly beautiful, evidently. Or Jacob calls his 130 years few and more difficult than his ancestors, which seems very newsworthy to Pharaoh, the Pharaoh he says this to. That's about all the detail I can give in the time available. But... Some hear this, and they have this common question, and they say, Mike, well, you're saying there's some kind of parallel universe. What kind of uh, science fiction nonsense is this? And so let me say simply, you know, Christians believe that Jesus is walking around right now in a different physical world to our own. That he was raised bodily from the dead as a man with skin and bones and all the rest, and he took his eternal body into heaven, wherever heaven is. And he still walks around there. That's what Christians believe. If he's walking around there, it's a world of some time. There's something under his feet for his physical body to be walking on. Uh, There's no spaceship we could send to find that place. Now, if you want to call that science fiction, you can. But that's what Christians have believed for two millennia. The apostles themselves witnessed Jesus ascending into the air until his body disappeared. And they testified it went into heaven as a full human body. So if there is lots of data in Genesis 2 to 11 to suggest what I'm saying, Christians should at least be open to it because we believe in other worlds outside our own, like the heaven where Jesus walks even today. So the book then goes on to explore many ideas connected to this. It has a chapter talking, as we've heard, about theistic evolution and how to understand that biblically. If we propose that Cain met people who had somehow arrived in our world via evolution. Especially the question, how many millennia back might we think God added a soul, a human soul, an eternal soul, to those homo sapiens that had evolved? And what are the advantages of such an understanding over an atheistic evolutionary position? And here's a key advantage, right? It's that we don't believe in a history where the first human with dignity and value, value above the animals, looked over at his grandpa and saw someone who wasn't human and didn't have that dignity and value. That just doesn't make sense morally. How would God have put somebody in that position? How are they going to deal with their relatives? God didn't put any people in that position. You can see chapter 3 for details of talking about that. So the argument builds until you get to chapter 5 and its discussion of the Tower of Babel, where because of this new way of reading Genesis 1 to 11, I can name the language confused as Sumerian, say where and when it was confused point in history to such a tower built at the right time and the right place by people whose language fits the bill, it was confused and dispersed at the right time. And I don't need to deny that other languages existed at the time of that confusion, and I have a close look at Genesis 11 to explain that in the book. So all of this can then fit neatly into the timeline that Genesis outlines and be consistent with mainstream history. So what happens through the book then, it puts more and more paint on the canvas as it goes 
until there's a holistic, coherent painting at the end that I'm suggesting is at least as plausible as the other approaches that hold to a high view of the Bible. So, if you do read the book, and I realise there's some chance that you're here, I do encourage you to take it all in before you dismiss the ideas, especially if you feel close to Christianity or on the edge of a faith crisis because of evolution. I do invite you to have a look here before you give up. I think there's still room, lots of room, to believe what the Bible says at its core, that God loves the world He has made, that He loves you, that you do have moral dignity and value much higher than the animals, and an eternal soul that they don't. And that God has not only given you and me life by creating us, but He has rescued us by giving us no less than His Son to die for our sins and rise again to give us eternal life. And it's all marvellous. And it's both beautiful and also we can still believe it's true. So thank you again for coming out tonight.